reading today that Mitch read for us. And it's a wonderful story of Elijah, and there are many wonderful stories of Elijah in the Old Testament. And he is a prophet to King Ahab in the northern kingdom. So a little history on the kingdoms and how they became, came to be. The Israelite people, the 12 tribes, wanted a king because everyone else around them had kings. And so Samuel appointed Saul, and then David, and then Solomon came. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. Before Rehoboam, those 12 tribes spread out over a great distance was called the United Kingdom. For so for 100 years, they lived pretty peaceably with one another until Rehoboam came along. And he started heavily taxing the people and inscripting them into slavery. And so 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel didn't want anything to do with that. And so they broke off and they became the Northern Kingdom. And the last of tribes were the Southern Kingdom. The Southern Kingdom capital was Jerusalem. The Northern Kingdom made Samaria their kingdom. So King Ahab is the king to the northern kingdom. And Elijah is his prophet. Now the northern kingdom, with Ahab being the king, he was a ruthless, evil individual. So ruthless that the Bible says in chapter 16 of 1 Kings, it says, as the Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than those before him. He did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all of Israel before him. This guy is a bad dude. He was going against everything that God had laid down. And then he married a lady called Zezebel. She was as ruthless as he was. She was not, <laughs> you're laughing, she, she was bad. She came not from, she was not an Israelite, she actually came from a northern territory of just to the north of the northern kingdom called Phoenicia. And so they would worship multiple gods. And one of the gods that they worshiped was Baal or Baal. And that god is the god of rain and thunder. And so she brought all this worship of multiple gods with her when she married Ahab. And it kind of provided the northern kingdom with a little bit of security because she knew all those people that were trying to invade the northern kingdom. So they kept them a little bit safer. She brings all her idols with her. They start building temples everywhere and, and uh, altars everywhere so that they could worship all these multiple gods. And so they completely gave up the first commandment of you shall serve no other god, right? So. King, is, King Ahab and Queen Zezebel were known to kill many, many prophets and priests. It's recorded over 400 of them. And so they were ruthless. And so here's poor Elijah is the prophet to them now. And Elijah tells King Ahab this. He says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years, except by my word. Well, that's a pretty big deal. Because Ahab and Zezebel are worshiping the god of Baal, who is the god of rain. And so Elijah's saying, your god, Baal, will not be able to do anything about this drought. Our Lord, the Lord of lords, is number one, and he is all-powerful. And so, as I said, they completely dismissed the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And now, Elijah is enemy number one, right? He's telling them that the one true God will cause a drought, and their God, Baal, can't do anything about it. So being public enemy number one, his words of prophecy are not being well accepted by the king or the queen or the people around. 
But the Lord is faithful to Elijah, and he protects him, and he tells him in a dream, leave this land, go to the east side of the Jordan River, and even though there's a drought, you will have water, and I'll give you shelter, and the ravens will feed you morning and night. So he's still in the northern kingdom, but he's far away from Zezebel and uh, Ahab. So Elijah's obedient. He's delivered this message to the king about what God is going to do unless they turn things around. He's been obedient to get out of the way and go to the east side of the Jordan River. <clears throat> away from the king that is known to kill priests and prophets. And he's trusting that God will, in fact, feed him by the birds. The birds will come morning and night. And so instead of balking at that, it said, so he did what the Lord told him. He was obedient to that. So when the drought really affected where Elijah was, his water also dried up. And so that's when the Lord says, go to Zarephath. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you food. And it says, so he went. Well, this is uh, no small thing either. Because Zarephath is in Phoenicia, the homeland of Zezebel, the queen that wants to kill him. And it says, so he went. And this is about a 90-mile trek from where Elijah is. He has to go over a mountainous terrain to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and then go north up to Zarephath, right in the heart of enemy territory. And it also says is he went. He doesn't question God at all. He just goes. That's amazing to me. I don't think I would have blamed Elijah for saying, are you kidding me, God? You're going to send me on this long trek of over 90 miles over some pretty darn hilly ter ter terrain and then put me right into the hands of the woman that wants to kill me, into the land. And then you're telling me that this widow will feed me. Well, she, the widow, in that time, had no means of supporting themselves well. So it's so unlikely that she would have enough food for him as well as herself and her son. And she's Phoenician. She's not an Israelite. She doesn't have to listen to him. She doesn't worship his God. She worships Baal. But he goes. Elijah arrives at the gate. He sees this woman. Somehow he knows it's her and asks for some water to drink and something to eat. And the woman replies in a manner that probably we would expect her to say, that she doesn't have a lot of support for herself, so she doesn't have enough for herself. She says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little jug of oil. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Those are words of tremendous hardship and scarcity, aren't they? They're not welcoming words saying, come on over, I got lots. It's hardship and scarcity. And so, in obedience, Elijah says, do not be afraid. That's what the angels typically say when they come. It's what Jesus says to his disciples. And it's what Elijah says to her. Do not be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain to the land. So again, we may expect this widow, and probably rightly so, say and question Elijah in saying, no, I don't have enough for you. I don't have enough for myself and my son. Go away. 
find someone else. By the way, I've been in the drought too. You're an Israelite, I'm a Phoenician. I don't need to listen to you. But what does she do? She went and did as Elijah told her. This woman is displaying tremendous faith and obedience to the will of the God of Israel. God is faithful to his promise to Elijah for protecting him, for feeding him, for giving him shelter, and now for a safe passage to where he is at. And he's faithful to the promise to the widow because her jar of oil never runs out. Her jar of flour never runs out. And later in the story, when her son dies, Elijah brings him back to life. Elijah and the widow both trust God and act in faith when it didn't seem to make sense. They were willing to act and trust as they were told. So I say all of that to set up the message for today. And that is to say that they received, the widow and Elijah received the promise of God and it was the basis of the thing that they did next. They both received the promise of God, and it was the basis of what they did next. <clears throat> God is present in this story, and he's present in our story right now. God's promise is that there is life out of death, hope out of despair, abundance out of scarcity, and the promise that started in the Old Testament is a foretaste of the promise of resurrection that we claim through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The challenge for us, though, is do we really trust and receive God's promise and have it be the basis of the thing we do next? challenge. Do we do that? Do we receive the promise of God and have that be the basis of what we do next? It's a challenge because the world's narrative runs contrary to God's narrative. The world's narrative this week said something like this. There's violence and another mass shooting. There's fires that destroyed entire towns the size of Marion. They showed one fire in California that covered almost the entire Lynn County. That's the world's narrative that creates fear in us and despair in us and doubt. God's narrative is counter to that. something that was shared in our class this week. I took a few of those statements from our opening devotion because they're true to this statement as well, to today. It's this. God's promise is this, that God is still on his throne despite the world's narrative. That Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The power of death was swallowed up by the cross. The tomb is still empty. The power of the Holy Spirit resides in us. Prayer is powerful and effective. And God is always with us to the ends of the age. God was present in the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. And God is present in our story right now. But God's story and our story, it runs countercultural to God's. And as children of God, we are heirs to the promise of God. We are called to trust and receive the grace of God and act in faith like the widow and like Elijah did. And so I pray for you and I pray for me that we can trust and receive the promises of God 
make it the basis of what we do next. That we can receive the promises of God and make it the basis of what we do next. Because we need to embrace daily God's promise for our lives. Not the world's narrative, but God's story. Because that world's narrative runs contrary to what God loves us and gives us abundant mercy and grace. That's the narrative we need to hang on to when we turn on that news channel and see the world's narrative. God's narrative runs opposite to that. Hang on to the promise of God's love, his mercy, and his grace. Receive the promise of God and make it the basis of what you do next. For that we say, amen.